by Dr. Thomas Reardon. Dr. Thomas Reardon is a professor in the Department of Agricultural Food and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. Prior to joining MSU, he worked with IFRI for eight years. Uh, Tom's research focuses on links between agri-food industry, transformations, and food security in Asia. And he is listed in Who's Who in Economics, was an invitee to World Economic Forum in 2009, and is also a member of the WEF's Global Alliance Council for Food Security. He is going to talk about the other end of the supply chain, uh, talk about the ice in the era of supermarket. Uh, with that, Tom. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and my focus is not going to be on the farm level, except in a way that, in a sense, the farm level is affected by the other levels in the supply chain. And I think it's important to emphasize, and as I'm going to be speaking about the rice industry and the rice market, that 50 to 75 percent of the rice price that's paid by the consumer in Asia is formed by the segments of the supply chain that come after the farm. Distribution and logistics, processing, retail, these are basically the segments that form 50 to 75 percent of the rice price. And yet the discussion already at this conference might have touched on those segments 5% of the time or 1% of the time. So I think that that investment of those and understanding of those has to become central to understanding the overall rice economy. Now, to summarize that idea, I, the, talk, the talk is called Rice in the Era of the Supermarket, and I'll focus on Asia and I'll use some field research that's been funded by the Asian Development Bank uh, mainly and to, uh, in order to illustrate this, and of course the points will be general because I don't have time to go into great detail, but of course I'm talking about areas that are heterogeneous and so there's lots of differences across the area. So I'll talk about tendencies and future movements and moving averages. And I'll start with a set of points about structural change in the rice industry then I'll look at conduct change in the rice industry, and finally performance change in the rice industry. And my first set of points will deal with trends that have been occurring in the 1990s and 2000s in, in the industry, let's say especially in Asia where I'll focus, and you can think of these as symbiotic trends, that is they're co-evolving, they're very related. The first one, one I'm very passionate about, is the consolidation and multinationalization in retail, simply put, the rapid rise of supermarkets. And what we've been finding is that supermarkets that might have been a very small share of the food uh, industry or food economy in 1990 even in Asia have gone to be 30, 50 more percent of the food economy by the end of the 2010. And an example from our recent work is that while there were no supermarkets in, at the end of the year in 1989 in China, by the study that we did this year, we found that 50% of rice retail in Beijing is going through supermarkets. Now, this is about the early 1990s, late 1980s in Hong Kong. So it's lagging behind that, but it's already changed very quickly. It's lagging behind overall penetration of supermarkets and processed food, which is around 75% in the largest cities in China, but it's catching up. Now, in Delhi, where we just did a study, and 85% of the supermarket sales in Delhi have been formed in the past three years, so this is very recent. Already, supermarkets have 7% of the rice retail in Delhi. The concomitant point, of course, is that there's been, as in many parts of the world, the trend that you see also in Northeast Asia and East Asia is now occurring in Southeast Asia and, and starting in South Asia and certainly in China, which is the decline of the traditional rice shops. So there's a fundamental shaking up of the retail side of the rice economy. Then there's also a shake up that's occurring really over the past decade or a little bit more, in, depending on the country, in the milling sector with rapid consolidation and mechanization, a rise of large and medium mills, 
And we've watched it in our studies, a rapid decline of the small rural rice mills. And a rise, this has been fascinating in our study in Beijing with Heilongjiang uh, province, that there's a rise of direct relationships between the mill and the wholesaler, and the mill and the supermarket, cutting out the rural broker, the semi-wholesaler, all these pieces of the chain that we've come to think of are there. Third point of structural change is related to the point I just made, which is the rapid consolidation and disintermediation in rice wholesaling. There's a rise of medium and large wholesalers that we found are representing directly sets of mills or single mills, okay, and a decline of the small rural rice brokers in many areas. The last structural point is that um, just as downstream from the farmer one seen rapid ferment and change in Asia, also upstream, as is evidenced by the presence of Bayer and other agri-input companies at this conference, there's been a growth, consolidation, multinationalization in the inputs being sold to farmers, a rise of large seed chemical companies, the start of the rise of one-stop shop rural modern input retail, if you want input supermarkets that one is seeing in India and the rural business hubs, the decline of the state sector that was so important in input retail in decades past in China, India, and elsewhere. So in four ways, structural change has been occurring very quickly in what was thought to be a sleepy sector. Now, all of that is inducing waves of change of the conduct, of the behavior in supply chains of rice. First one that you can see is coming really immediately from these trends is disintermediation. So <clears throat> when I started to do this research with colleagues, everyone says, well, the way the rice supply chain looks in Asia is there's a farmer, and then there's a rural broker, and then it goes to a mill, and then it goes to a broker between the mill and the city, then it goes to a wholesaler within the city, then it goes to a semi-wholesaler, and then it goes to the, to the traditional retailer. Many hands. Lots of inefficiency, okay? But in fact, what we've seen is that in very many places, there's a shift from these long supply chains to much shorter chains with disintermediation. And along with that shift has come a shift from the informal sector to formalization. For example, in the Beijing study and other places, we've seen a shift from rice sold loose to rice now sold packaged, labeled, branded, 80% of the wholesale market <laughs> rice in Beijing is sold packaged, labeled, and branded. 80%. That was much, much lower just five years ago. And with that comes in, uh, incipient traceability, the importance of which I'll point out in a second. A third topic in change of conduct in supply chains, which sends me <laughs> into uh, you know, paroxysms of obsession, really, is this issue of the product cycle of the value ladder climbing that one can see happening in the rice sector as well as the non-rice sector in Asia. Shifting from local niches, building them up into commodity rices that are sold at zone level, national level, and international levels into commodity cost-competed products, and then with differentiation into, uh, of these commodity rices into quality differentiated rices that is by far the wave of the future and differentiation into safe rice, green food for example in the rice sector in Beijing is rising very quickly, organic rices and what we think, when I say we, I've been talking a lot and working a lot on this with Peter Timmer, in fact this is an outline of our joint paper that we're preparing Thursday uh, but this is, there's a probable trend toward traceability, and all of these things will conspire to make that happen. And we think that traceability will be a key thing in the rice sector for the same reason that it became so in the beef, milk, and produce sector. Because the, all the points that have been made about the incursion of cities into the rice areas means also incursion of pollution, of metals, there's going to be the same kind of PCB crisis that affected the fuel sector in Europe. You'll have several major crises like that in Asia in the next five years. I'm sorry to say, I really believe that'll happen. And the traceability topic uh, will become very central in rice. On the other hand, besides those challenges we're faced with opportunities, food security increased through greater efficiency in, in the uh, supply chains. 
supermarkets as motors of rice market quality differentiation and labeling. And all of this uh, will increase incentives right up the supply chain to the farmers. Now, I have uh, some open questions that I feel privileged to just throw on the, the table, which are two. I've been thinking, what the heck is the role of policy in private-public partnerships to address these challenges and pursue these opportunities? Is this just a thing that will happen parallel? Or will policy interact with it? Will it make it faster? Will it make it easier? Will it include more people? Will it make it more effective? And the last question I had actually flipped the other way around when I was sitting this morning listening to the plenary. I'm thinking, hey, you know, everybody has in their mind a rice farmer, informal rice farmer, and a big government guy. Okay, that's the way all these debates go. Over and over and over again, like a broken <coughs> record. Okay, and of course, when there's a crisis, it becomes more of a broken record. It spins a little bit faster. But really, these changes I'm talking about are a lot more important over the longer term than some policy debates here and there as you're bumping along. How will these things change the policy debate? How will these actors that are consolidating turn around and say, as they have in the produce sector, they have in the dairy sector, they have in the meat sector, they have in the non-food sector, they turn around and policymakers and they say, hey, make this work, cut down the resistance, cut down the constraints, we need to make this market grow. What are you going to do about that? And there's going to be a heavy pressure in the future that will affect how the policies and how these market structures and regulations develop, just in the way that crop science people are doing at present, influencing the regulations and the property rights that envelop the supply chain at the input end. So with that, I conclude. Thank you.